Hey dudes, welcome back to another episode of our Moss Men's Team podcast. You are about to listen to one of our prior team meetings. If you ever want to join one of our live sessions that we have every Monday and Friday, head over to romas.com. That's R-H-O-M-A-S dot com and put your email in and we will send you a live link every time we record. We generally record on Mondays and Fridays. So if you ever want to be on the actual podcast, if we bring men up all the time to talk about their goals, talk about their obstacles, etc., uh, head over to ramas.com. And then also, if you want to help support the channel grow and also have access to exclusive content, book reviews, extra whiteboard sessions, etc., and some coaching sessions, uh, head over to patreon.com and support us. We would love it. But if not, no biggie. Um, we'll see you on the live sessions. Later, dudes. Enjoy this podcast. no idea what that actually does mm. is insane to me. Now you're an exception because I know that the ab workout is just part of your like overall program, if that makes sense. Mm. But I have a friend, for instance, who wants to get a six pack. So every single time he goes into the gym, um, he goes and he does ab workout. And I tell him repeatedly that he's massively un overestimating what that actually does. So like, if you think about like this, so even if you have a goal to get a six pack. So, and, and let me I'll, uh, explain to you, even like an extreme scenario, the guys on our team, um, on our, on our men's physique bodybuilding team, uh, guess how many of them do abs. And this is when they step up on stage, right. At just absolutely shredded. Uh, like three, zero, really zero. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting, right? Literally mm -hmm. abs is not in our curriculum to do it. Now I subsequently do, I do this ab wheel because I do think it gives me a tiny, tiny, tiny edge, but that, that tiny edge is the difference between like, you know, a plus 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 and a plus 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 plus, right? It's, it's this mm -hmm. little, super little tiny thing now. And the reason is actually very simple. And I think if people were to understand this, they could start rededicating their resources to when they go into the gym and they're doing abs towards stepping on the treadmill, because what happens is, your abs, if you think about it like this, like are kind of like knuckles, right? So if, if you were to lay, so this is straightforward. And if you lay down your knuckles stick, stick up like that, right? So mm. do you see this like little gap right in here? Yeah. Well, there's a layer of fat on top of those, on top of that gap. So your, your objective or somebody who's, whose goal is to, to get a six pack, the objective is to reduce the fat sitting on, on top of the abs, right? Now, when you do, when you work out your abs, Basically, we're trying to do or what most people, I guess, kind of think they're trying to do is you're trying to build that muscle. Well, the, the abs mu ab muscles are not really going to grow astronomically large. Now, you've probably never seen somebody who's just bulging out of their abs, right? They, those muscles are not meant to grow like a bicep is meant to grow large. So no, another thing that you can do is you can stretch out those and you you, you increase kind of the, the the depth of the gap, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? So then you can get that fat to fall in. So that's kind of where you can get a little bit of an edge, if that makes sense. Um, but most people should not be focused on, instead of doing 30 minutes of ab workout, get your ass on the treadmill to reduce that that fat sitting on, on top of your abdomen wall, and you'll produce dramatically better results. Like, and and by the way, this is, I studied health and fitness and, and working out for decades, and it wasn't until my bodybuilding coach told me, he's like, nope, no abs, zero. And it didn't even make sense to me. And this was just a handful of years ago. And then I did it and I was like, holy shit, this actually works. That's yeah, it's so pretty funny. wild. Well, it's funny because it just comes up once a week for me. And I'm like, oh, nice. My easy workout. It's, it's super easy because you're like just laying on your back, twisting your legs around. And it's like, it's pretty easy. So I'm always like, sweet. It's an easy one. Well, here's the other thing. It is definitely needed for core. Yeah. Right, like that. That's why everybody should do them, but they're do doing them for, I would say, like the wrong reasons. And yeah. oftentimes, even when they're doing it, they're not really working out their core. Like they're, they're kind of doing some pretty simple exercises. You're doing it from an app, so you're probably are hit, hitting the full core. Um, but I do definitely agree with it for building core stability because that's sort of the essence of everything else. But for the aesthetics, it doesn't do much. It does some, but it doesn't do anywhere near as much as, as people think it does. So like th that's the whole myth of like spot reduction when people are like, I'm going to do this specific workout and then I'm going to tone this specific part of my body. Mm, good question. So that gets a little tricky because spot reduction from my understanding, and this is like across the board of the experts that I've studied from, um, is not possible, but they are referring to the technical definition of spot reduction. Meaning I've got this little piece of, of, you know, 
fat back here or looks it looks bad in my in my lower back so i'm going to try to i'm going to try to make that look better you can actually do that you might not be reducing the fat in that particular area right like th th that fat will come down as a total pr uh, percentage of your overall body fat if that makes sense okay but i got you you can manipulate that area so let's just say for instance let's say i've got let's just say i've got um my my chest right there's a certain amount of fat on my chest well if i go and do push-ups right it's going to make my chest look more muscular right it's going to give the the optics that my chest is more pronounced right but i didn't reduce the fat in that area but i did accomplish the objective of likely what i was trying to accomplish of making it look like that so i think there's a, an incongruence with what people say or think their goal is between what it technically is if that makes sense mm -hmm. like a lot of people say like oh i want to gain 20 pounds of muscle it's like okay number one that is extremely hard to do and number two that's probably not even really what you want to do right what you probably want to do is look more muscular right mm -hmm. so you could probably gain five more pounds of muscle and lose a little bit of fat and you look exactly like you want to look does that make sense yeah no that makes perfect sense so like an example of this is um you ever see a very common example you ever see brad pitt in a uh, fight club by any chance yeah yeah, yeah. so he looked kind of shredded you know, so people thought like he was pretty muscular. I mean, some people thought that. Well, he was like 150 pounds, right? So, so, so he was not 195 pounds of, of solid muscle or 220 yeah, yeah. pounds of solid muscle, right? He's 150 pounds. When I stepped on stage, I stepped on stage at 153 pounds. I looked super shredded and I looked very large, like especially in pictures because of the lighting, because of like, you know, because you now have contrast. Like when you see clear definitions of muscle, you, you give the illusion that you're much larger. But you're not, I wasn't 220 pounds. I was 153 pounds. I'm six foot two inches tall, right? That's damn right. That is not, you know, that is that is very slender. Um, so and this helps in terms of in terms of achieving your goals because I think the effectiveness the the success zone is much larger than you think it is, and the effectiveness zone is much larger than you think it is. Because I think what happens with people is they choose the you should always choose the simple minimal before complex optimal. So because complex optimal definitely gets results, but it usually makes you tap out before you get those results versus simple minimal makes you more effective because you're likely to do it more consistently. And when you get consistency, you get more momentum. Mm -hmm. So for instance, right? Like, you know, instead of going and doing P90X, right? Chances are you could just start with push-ups every day because you're going to do push-ups every day and you're going to see actual effectiveness, right? You're going to see a change in your physical appearance just from push-ups versus P90X. A lot of those movements are very complex and your brain is likely to tap out before because you're just not ready for that. Yes, mm -hmm. it might be optimal, let's just say, right? It might be optimal to eat exact macronutrients, you know, cut up your food, weigh them out, get it, you know, 200, 200 grams of protein, X amount of carbs, X amount of fat every single day. Yes, that would be optimal for sure. But if you don't do it, it's not optimal at all. It's not effective versus you are way more likely to do the minimal. And then James Clear in the Atomic Habits book outlines this, this very clearly. So simple minimal before complex optimal. That makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. Even like, you know, when people are like, you know, I, I need more money. I need more money. <clears throat> it's like, all right, well, what are you trying to do? And they're like, uh, I just want to go on a vacation. It's like, all right, we'll start a savings account that's just for vacations and put 50 bucks a month in it. And they're like, mm -hmm. it's like you do, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, I can actually do, I don't, I don't need a $40,000 a year. I mean, it'd be nice and I'll, I could still try to get one, but for my intensive purposes to not feel like I'm a tail spinning failure, it's like, I'll just set, let's just set a goal to go on a trip for like four days for a weekend, set, set, you know, 50 to hundred bucks. Um, per month or whatever you can afford and then you know at the end of a year you're like holy shit here's all this extra money i didn't waste on bullshit um you know so it, that does help i, I kind of like that of just kind of plugging in like the smallest and most simple things so that that was the thing that i'm still trying to develop i'm almost i'm almost done actually that the part of the research in that book that i need to read um i'm, I'm doing some flying this weekend so i'm taking i'm going to take advantage of that and do like a lot of that reading but the the thing i really want to kind of push, I guess, is the idea of just simply plugging a different thing and, you know, it's just a habit, but just starting the work of plugging something different into your day than you, you know, usually would do. Like you were saying, Wes, like try to do 40 pushups, try to do that a day, man. It's like, you know, it's not, you know, yeah, you're not going to turn into the Hulk or transform overnight, but you're going to gain a momentum 
and start kind of get into the business of like authoring your day in a way that's conscious rather than just kind of, again, the mode I talk about all the time that I'm always on the precipice of slipping back into, which is knee jerk reaction land, looking at my phone, reading stuff and then participating in whatever that is of just like, you know, the, uh, the global kind of impulse attention snag that's just constantly just kind of grabbing you and like, come here, get this, get this, get this, get this, look at this, look at this. Oh my God, you should be angry. Look at, oh, this is bad. It's like, dude, just like put that down in the morning, do your other stuff. And then once you're actually kind of, I don't know, shaping your own day that you, you see that stuff pop up and it's just more or less feels more like a pop-up ad than like, Oh my God, mm. uh, you know, so that that's been like super helpful for me. And for those people who may have gotten say, Oh, so I can't even do 40 pushups. Cause you said you just do 40 pushups for the day. Just do one, yeah. right? What, what, whatever that, and if you can't even do one, then do the pushups where you start on your knees and not on your feet. Like it, it doesn't, it literally doesn't matter what the thing is. Just pick whatever the minimal unit is to start making progress. And that is typically the gateway drug to doing more. So mm -hmm. I guarantee if you say your, if you set your goal up as doing one push up, chances are if you, if you get up the energy to do one push up, let's say you roll right out of bed. Cause Matt, what you're referring to also is, uh, is habit stacking or one of the concept is habit stacking. So put things in your schedule. Let's just say like you already have the habit of, um, of brushing your teeth. Well, if you have the habit of brushing your teeth, well, put the floss right next to it. So you now stack that that newer habit that you're trying to accomplish on top of a, an existing habit. Get your brain into like this automatic pilot. But oftentimes what happens, and BJ Fogg, the researcher from Stanford University on, on, um, per, uh, on persuasion and momentum, psycho uh, psychological momentum, um, famous researcher, has studied this as well. Like just do the one thing. So if you're, if you are habit stacking and then you make the goal very minimal and simple. So I'm going to put my floss next to my toothbrush and my goal is to just floss one tooth. Well, the probability of you only flossing one tooth is very minimal, but you mm -hmm. got it started. So chances are you're, you're at least going to do two. Well, you just increased your output by a hundred percent. Instead of doing one, you're doing two. And if you do two, you're more likely to do three maybe the next day. And then all of a sudden you get this consistency. Consistency builds momentum. And then momentum ultimately builds duration. So you're doing it consistently and then all of a sudden you're doing it for a long period of time. And now you're starting to get more and more and more results. And it's this positive snowball. Yeah, dude. I'm I'm uh it's funny too, because you the habit stacking thing, I kind of did that. I didn't know that's what it was, but when I told you last time, I rearranged my like my daily habits on my little a little scorecard thing. Mm -hmm. When I started to rearrange them in a way where I tried to I was saying like nest them in each other. So it's like, yep. I, I kind of, the first thing I want to start doing, I was just thinking about this is like, there's a, there's a, you know, and I would say I failed at this today, but it's like, if I wake up, you know, barring like, you know, I usually, I take Maya first and do all that and give her back. But if I wake up and come right down to this piece of paper, that's like a, my first win of the day. And today I didn't do, I got sidetracked because in my head, I know what I'm supposed to do, but what I do sometimes is I'll do them out of order. I'm like, well, I want to do this one first. And to me, that's kind of, you know, it's, it helps if I start in the way that I'm, I'm laying out for myself. Not to, like it's not the end of the world, but like you were saying, it helps build that momentum and it helps me kind of do those certain things. Um, but so I started doing just like writing is tough for me sometimes where I'm like, well, uh, I got to confront this. Like, you know, you got to confront the idea that you don't know what you're going to write about. Is it going to suck? Is it this? Da, 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 da. So I start, I do journaling first. It's just like, you know, this is what I, this may be like what my, I dreamed about. This is kind of what I'm thinking about. And then from there, it's the, I'm in the word process where I minimize a window and I just start writing. Whereas if I just like, you know, walk my dogs and I'm like, oh, uh, you know, so it, dude, it helps. I can say for sure that helps big time. Um, oh, absolutely. And also, like I said, for me, the meditation first thing in the morning, again, failed at that today, but I'll still get it done. Uh, if I can come down and like not be like, well, let me do this first. Let me do that first. If I can completely close all those tabs in my mind, come down here, sit in this chair and just grab this piece of paper and just start doing what it says on here. You know, it, it's every single day I do that. I feel good. And the days I don't, I don't feel horrible, but I'm like, God damn it. You know, mm. my day goes off. It, my day starts entering that kind of drift where it's like, well, I do got to do this and let me do this for, you know, it's just like drives me nuts. Yeah. It brings up a, a great point. And good morning, everybody to, uh, on the comments. Sorry, Matt and I just got on a hot one right out the gate here today. And, uh, <laughs> uh, Ray Delco, Jim, uh, Jeff, uh, is it Jeff? O? what's up guys? Um, yeah, I think, I think, so what I used to do, and I'm probably going to get back to was being very, very disciplined, well, not even disciplined, what's the right word, um, very strict around no interruptions before 10am. 
Um, and that was, I would wake up I, and this was too early. I, w- I would not want to wake up. I used to wake up like 4 45, 5 AM and then have a set of habits all the way up until 10 AM because no fire drills are that important where I can't handle them after 10 AM. And, but I'm telling you, like when I used to do that, it was three, four, you know, five hours of pure habits and progress. So that way, literally by 10 AM I'm done everything that I would have been done. It would take me all day the, you know, uh, prior to having that habit, but I, you know, you're inspiring me to, I might consider doing that again, probably not waking up at five only because I don't think that's optimal in congruence with like your circadian rhythm, maybe like a 6am thing and then no interruptions. So no friction, just me and the habits, um, up until a certain point in time, 10, 10, 11 AM. Yeah. I would say definitely to do that before you have a kid, because that's yeah, like, I would assume. as soon yeah. as after is it, it's like, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, I, I would love to just wake up and, you know, and, and it will come back again at some point. But yeah, now it's like what I have to do is kind of hammer out these like negotiations that are like, you know, for anyone who's about to have I, a couple people actually were writing that one guy's actually waiting for his kid right now. And I think someone else is having one pretty soon. If you're trying to really get after it, it's like it's kind of difficult because you don't want to be like, I'm too busy because you do want to spend time with your kid. But you also mm-hmm. kind of want to still maintain I, you know, I guess the steering wheel a little bit, because otherwise you, you're like, I, my daily struggle is, am I receding into the background of, you know, my wife's plan for the day, which, you know, I, I honor and keep in mind, but at the same time, like, you know, these are two plans need to go like this, you know, otherwise, you know, not like this in a bad way, but like, you know, here's what you want to do this time here, you know, and, and, and it's funny because she used to really hold my feet to the fire. Cause I'm like, look, I'm fine. I'll just, let's just do our thing. Like stop trying to schedule me or hold me down at times. Now it's the opposite where I'm like, what time are you doing this? What time are you doing that? Cause it's like, I'll, you know, I'll work with that, but I can't deal with the hazy, like, let's just hang out for a while. Then we'll see what it's, it's like. No. So, you know, that's been something I've been trying to do where it's like, you know, I, I take my hour and a half till she's so hungry, give her to Brittany. And then from there, it's like, that's my time where I'm like, Hey, here you go. I two hours, just let me, let me do my thing here for a minute. And it's like, dude, once you, once you got to start fighting for your time like that, for me, I was like, what the fuck was I doing? I had so much free time, just un unfettered free time that I just, Oh my, it would be like just walking with money, just falling out of your pockets and you're just like, <laughs> wow, I God damn it. But you know, it's good though. Yeah. Well, and, and, um, I think hearing those cautionary tales, like, Hey, you don't know how good you have. And obviously not just situation is bad by any means, but it's like no, no. realize the resources that you have right now, because someday you might not have those same exact resources. And of course you'll figure it out. Um, yeah. but no, that's a good tale. And also, um, one of the comments from Ray uh, over here in the comment section, mm-hmm. uh, he was talking about that he uses a physical calendar versus a digital calendar. And I, that's actually a phenomenal idea. Like, because the computer kind of represents the infinite, like it can do so many things. Well, it can't show you so many things on one page. And then eventually just like, when, you know, when, let's say when I was on wall street, we were doing trading and all those things, you got so many little, little, little things, you know, popping up on your screen that eventually they don't mean much. If that makes sense. So yeah. same thing for a counter. Eventually you get so many notifications that notifications are no longer notifications because they're blending into into the screen and into the background. Um, so I completely agree, as Matt and I have talked about a lot before, is building your physical environment. Because if there's a calendar, if, if your goals are on your are on your desk, right, you can't just minimize the window. It's on your desk and you see it 55 times a day. Yeah, man. And also there's another thing too. The first thing too, uh, Ray said another thing too, was just like, you know, adding a kid isn't, you know, it, from what I think he means by it is not the thing that throws you off. It's like adding the kids wonderful. It like kind of, for me, it like kind of focused me in on what I'm doing and kind of keeps me from just kind of like, it's hard to just, for me, it's hard to like lollygag and just look at my kid. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just chill. You know? So like it, for me, it kind right. of focused me in the level of the game. It does. And it, but the thing it helps you do is like, yeah, like in terms of like, you know, if you're like, if I'm on my phone, and like it, for me, it's like I have to ditch all of this other stuff, this bullshit stuff. That's what Ray's saying. Like, give up the bullshit, like the social media, all this other stuff, TV during the day, out of the fucking question. That's a rule I, I hold down. I'm actually I threatened Brittany with a parental control on the TV today. <laughs> 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 Too much glee, dude. But the um, but yeah, man, it's like, but it, it, then you can just you know, it, it's like you can go two ways about it. And again, this isn't like a you know a must for anybody, but for people who are sitting there like, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. What the fuck am I doing with my time? It's like, dude, you can burn off probably like 40% of the time you spend on shit and be better off if I, you know, to be honest. Oh, that's probably a conservative estimate too. 
Yeah, man. I mean, you know, and it just you just do it. You know, it's weird. Like again, I, I remember just a dude a year and a half ago. I was every day waking up. Phone was the first thing I looked at. I had Facebook. I had Twitter. I think I had Instagram at the time. Yeah, I had Instagram. And dude, I spent a good portion of my day looking at Facebook, scrolling to see what people were writing, writing my own one here and there. And it's just like, dude, you know, it, it, it's just a total waste of my time. And I felt horrible. And I was like, people were like, I remember I would go like, I'm gonna delete my Facebook. Don't delete your Facebook. People are like, don't do that. And you're like, I'm going to do it. I did it. You're like, <laughs> oh, oh, my God. And it's like, it's totally inconsequential. It, has, it holds no meaning, nothing, no value any, for me personally. It was like I just got out of a bad, toxic thing, in my opinion, that was toxic for me. Mm -hmm. And it's just – and if you think about it, it's like Facebook is just a relation, uh, a weird relationship with yourself. I always say like social media is just cloud storage for your ego. It's just kind of like you just <laughs> – put shit out. You just, all your dumb, stupid thoughts. And then, you know, people like your stuff, you know, whatever. And it's just like, it's, it's totally doesn't mean anything unless you're using it as a tool and like getting on, getting off real quick. But even that is like, for me, it's not even worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree. Uh, I, I want to chat about if you're okay with this, Matt. Sure. Because I'm, I'm going through some relationships over right now and I'm, I'm, I've been consistently learning for years and reading books on relationships. I wanted to see if we can actually talk about uh, and maybe help, help the guys and ourselves um, about learning for relationships because, you know, one of the things you're bringing up, you know, about Brittany and the parental controls on TV and, and negotiating calendars and all of those things, there's a, you know, you're not the first person to have gone through those things. I'm not the first person to go, go through my things and, and in, in particular in a relationship. And one of the things that I stumbled upon because I'm a dumb male, it took me 30 some years to understand this, that if you are even considering getting married, that that will very likely be and actually not even very likely that will be the number one decision you make in your life. That's my that's my assumption. And I didn't come to that conclusion until three decades in, into my life, uh, 33 years uh, to be exact. So then I was like, holy shit, if I look at my if I look at my resources that I've dedicated towards that decision, versus you know the, re the the amount of time that I've dedicated towards my physical body, the amount of time that I've dedicated towards my career, the the amount of time that I've dedicated towards finance and investing. It, it's it's a mountain versus versus an inch worth of effort uh, in terms of, of finding a spouse. Mm -hmm. And that to me is absolutely insane. I, I have no idea why there that asymmetry exists and it's it's unbelievable how asymmetrical that that work effort has been. So are you cool if we talk about some of that stuff? Yeah, yeah. Dude, I I went out like on a quest starting a couple years ago and started reading about, about relationships. And that was something, especially being from Philadelphia, like my initial was like, what, what, do I need to, what do I need to read about? Really? It's like, oh, it's easy, right? Mm -hmm. That typical, you know, you know, macho sort of response. But holy shit, man, there is so much information, so much phenomenal information out there about relationships from people who've actually studied it. And for the guys listening, if you have never heard of John Gottman, um, please check him out. John Gottman and his wife, uh, I think it's Julie Gottman. And they are the Michael Jordans of the relationship world who they're, they're psychologists and they've studied this. And I think the Julie Gottman, I think she's a mathematician, I believe. And they're, they're brilliant but they have studied relationships to the point where they built this love lab um, and they had couples come yeah. in. Oh dude, it's, if you can't go to a, a conference in psychology on, on relationships and marriage without these people being referenced. Like they are literally the Michael Jordan of this industry. The reason you haven't heard of them is because it's not a very popular, you know, right? Glee mm. is more popular, right? Yeah. <laughs> so everybody, 100% of humans who are interested in pursuing a relationship or in a relationship should read seven principles for making marriage work. Just even if you're not married, it doesn't matter. But in there, they talk about the things that make a relationship work versus the things that don't. And they're not just making a hypothesis. Like they've studied this literally, I think it was over 3000 couples they had in this love lab, which was just an apartment. They had cameras all over the apartment and they got down to even testing they had sensors uh, um, or they would collect urine samples when they would go to the bathroom and test the stress hormones in their urine after altercations, right? I mean, yep. the, the level of detail that these people used is absolutely insane to the point where even when, when a couple would have an altercation, like they'd have them come over there for the weekend, right? And they just have cameras all over, 
right? And they just say, just go live like you were normally living. Act like you're on vacation right now. And then eventually like something comes up, right? Some sort of altercation comes up and then they would have a dialogue and they'd have cameras on them, on the couple uh, giving the dialogue. And then they'd have a, they have a jiggle meter in a seat to see how much somebody's, uh, how much somebody's fidgeting. They had uh, blood oximeter, uh, blood oximeter meters. I think that's what we call it to, um, and uh, heart pulse monitors to see how how fast their heart rate was. And then they even had them go back and had the couples observe their conversations and give them a play by play of what they were feeling when that person said it. Right. You you cannot get more technical. Mm -hmm. Right. It's because you have a psychologist and a mathematician working hand in hand. Right. So they measured all of this stuff. Long story short, they they became famous because I think it's something crazy within a 15 minute or hour long conversation, they can predict divorce rates within 95%. That's insane. Yeah, like you think about that. Like 15 minutes to an hour, they can predict divorce rates 95% accuracy. That is absolutely insane. So like go out and read those books. But Matt, did you, did you, I, I know did. you now, haven't finished, but have you read any of it? Yeah. Now that you mentioned, I remember the reading about the love lab and how they would hook people up and like measure their cortisol and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, man. Well, the, the the problem is, it's like I I I think all the stuff they're doing seems like super legit. The the thing that I personally struggled with was like, yeah. in the very beginning, I so you know, like I I when I was little, I remember like I, there was no like guidance in relationships. I remember my dad would be like, just dump your girlfriend before Christmas, and you don't have to get her a gift. And I was like, sweet, thanks, dad. <laughs> And he would always tell me, he's not making that up because I remember you told me that in college. You're like, yeah, yeah what, dude, my dad said just dump girls before Christmas, so then you don't have to pay 200 bucks for the present. I'm like, okay, that's yeah, no, <laughs> that was that was there were, yeah, that was the, the relationship advice. I, I had that, and he would always tell me, he's like, don't have kids, having kids sucks. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, appreciate that. <laughs> so that was his that was his thing, you know. So I had to figure that out on my own, and it's like. Yeah, and if, if you're not like, because a lot of they're, like you were saying, there's the impulse like, I'm not reading a relationship book. It's like, okay, well, where are you being reformed? Where, where are you being informed on how you approach relationships from if you're not reading it from a book or people who have studied it, you know, with the intention obviously of trying to keep them together? And it's like I was informed by I would just say I guess like TV, you know, that the cultural messages at large, and you know, the thing I was on was more or less like, I'm out. I you know I'm I want to have sex. I want to have sex with someone as attractive as human, you know, as I can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just my goal. And then once I do that, it's just, we're just two people. And then we have to like hang out and do stuff. I don't want. That was my conceptualization of relationships mm -hmm. early, mm -hmm. early on in, in into like an embarrassingly late portion of my life. Um, well, almost as men, that's almost what's implied, if not explicitly told for us to do. Yeah. It's like, yeah, go, Try to find like I would just go somewhere like and just find a stranger. I'm like, oh, you're hot, and I would just <laughs> raise comments. <laughs> <laughs> I was informed by America's dad, Bill Cosby. <laughs> oh, for all the people too in the, uh, you know what I'm gonna do? Sorry, I just thought about this because there's people. Before I go on my long and sorry, tragic, uh, romantic tale, let me do this for the YouTube because there was people who were saying they go on the YouTube and like, wh where are all the all these comments and stuff coming from? If you ever want to check it out, there you go. Just hop into this link and you can jump in. Oh yeah, and I got the it. actual thing. I have the I have it up. No one's in there. No one's talking. Oh, you do. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cuz yeah, I feel bad if people are commenting on YouTube because we can't I don't I can't see it at all. Yeah. So, the yeah, so that was kind of my approach forever. It was like I would find somebody who would just give me this kind of weird shallow attention and we would just reciprocate it and then try to like form a relationship and we would just fight and argue, fight and argue, break up. And then I would just find somebody else to do that with. That was kind of, that was my pattern. You know, we, you'd have fun here and there and there was obviously good stuff, but for the most part, it was wholly dysfunctional because I was more or less interacting with women on like a very one dimensional level where it would be kind of like, you know, like I expect to have sex a bunch of times a week. And, you know, like I, I know that I'm going to go do boring, stupid stuff that I don't like with you. And that, that was no, for real. That's how, that's how I thought about it. And it was never, no, I get it, man. It was never until like last year that I, dude, it wasn't, it wasn't until that, like, I, I remember like I was talking to my wife and I was just like, you know, starting to be like, well, what are you actually, what are you trying to do with yourself? You know, and it, this is how, you know, this is how, uh, late in the game, I kind of caught on to like, you know, maybe seeing a whole person rather than just being like, yeah, she's hot. Mm -hmm. We sleep in the yep. same bed. It's no big deal. <laughs> it's like, you know, and then you, you start to do that because what happens is you typically just idealize somebody. You, you find this girl, she's attractive, 
and you're just dealing with this version of her that you kind of have in your head and then the real person starts to emerge and you're like what the hell what the, what's that stop that don't do that you know and then you're just right. like oh i'm out this is bullshit but it's yeah. like you never really gave the person a, a full chance you know you never really gave the, you never really a again i say to everybody if you're currently dating right now if you can just not be a hornball again that was my always my downfall i, I would just get this sense of like desperation where i'm like i gotta go i gotta go i gotta go it's like just go out and just actually try to see if you can match up your you know what it is that you're trying to figure out what you want to do in life and if you can go you know you don't have to be one-to-one -one, like match it up and tell people like this is my plan this is what i'm trying to do with myself what are you trying to do with yourself rather than being like this chick's hot and i think i could have sex with her mm. it's just it's just dude it's a disaster to build it i mean again it could work you never know but I, I think you're at a, a serious disadvantage in the dating world because then you're approaching it from this like, am I worthy or not a place? You know, you find someone like, or am I enough to, you know, to get gain your physical attraction back versus like, hey, here's what I'm doing. Do you think this gels or not? And it's not like a pressure. It's not as pressurized. It's not as weird. It's not as like, you know, rejection laced because, you know, you just say like, yeah, no, no, not, not going to work. So. I think that helps big time. Yeah. And I think often, at least the way that I approached it in the past, and I think a lot of a, a way that a lot of guys approach it is you we're trying to get the trophy, right? That the, the female is the trophy versus what in reality, what you should be trying to get the partner to earn the trophy together. Yeah. And for me, that distinction is very, was very important and very similar to you, Matt. I, I didn't find that out. Right. And I still have to remind myself of that. I didn't, but I didn't find that out till very, I would say late in the game. Um, and it's so important. But one of the things I wanted to share from the book, uh, because I will be making a video about this at some point, like very consolidated notes, but that book was game changing to me. And I've listened to almost all of their interviews online on YouTube. And every single time I listen to something I'm like, oh, I think I, I write it down. But I want to share with you guys. So four major topics that they talk about, they talk. They, so they were asked, OK, how are you guys able to predict divorce rates within 95 percent? And if I'm wrong, it's 90 percent. It's, it's mm -hmm. extremely high. And they said, well, because I'm obviously studying all those, all of those thousands of couples, and then many pieces of data inside of their interactions, they came up with what they call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is these are ways of treating each other and arguing that are that can be very toxic to a relationship. So just real quick, and the and I'm I'm bringing these up to you guys because men we typically don't know how to resolve conflict very well, right? Like we know how to fight, we can do all of those things, but it's like you know. Yeah, outside of beating the hell out of each other and then just releasing all that tension, you can't do that right in, in the real world after you, you know become an adult. So these things really helped open my eyes. So I'll just go through super quick. So they're saying in a relationship, eventually when you get into a dispute, it's not that you should avoid disputes. It's you should know how to get through disputes in a respectful way. So the first thing that they said that that they call them masters or disasters of a relationship. So, so the disasters, disasters of relationships will do this. The first thing they'll do inside of like, let's say an argument is criticize. They make the criticism, the person, not the thing that's happening. So for instance, the way they describe it is like, you know, there's a difference between a soccer ball, right? Okay. The soccer ball is the problem. Well, I can point to that soccer ball and say, that's an issue. They say, that's not the same thing as you point to the person, right? As if the soccer ball is inside of them, right? If that makes sense, right? Like it's, so it's, it's, uh, you do this all the time. It's like, no, no, it's like, I'm upset that the kitchen is a mess, right? I need the kitchen to be clean, right? Not you always leave the kitchen messy. You are making the, that a personality trait. So the first thing is criticism. And the antidote to that is focus on the issue and saying what you need rather than what you don't like, if that makes sense. Yeah. The second thing is contempt. So contempt is con criticism, but from a place that's kind of on high, right? Like I always do this. You don't, right? Like, you know, why don't you do this? I do. So it's making it from a hierarchical standpoint. And I know that I have, I have very much a default way of being that way. You know, it's like, why, why are you even thinking about this? Like, you know, shouldn't you be smarter than this? So that, that, and that's a terrible thing for me to think, but that's a reflex, you know, cause I have read a certain amount of books about a topic, so I'll expect somebody who have done the same. And that, but that's an ir that's a that's a ridiculous expectation. So it's criticism is the second second horseman of the apocalypse. The third one is defensiveness. So we've all been in the situation where somebody gives you a critique, and instead of instead of trying to fix that problem, you fire back with a critique of them. Right. Like, oh, well, you're saying I didn't I didn't do the dishes, but you didn't make the bed. Right. Like that sort of thing. Well, that has nothing to do with the actual problem. And you're smiling because I know that that's you my move. That's checkmate, baby. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's my go-to, man. Like, well, I mean, you know, you don't really do that. Well. <laughs> it kills me, dude. I'll I'll catch myself, and dude, it's so funny because I've caught myself um, doing something the other day where we we're. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but you're arguing. You're arguing about a thing, and then she like will mistakenly be like, "Okay, well, I, I guess yeah, you did say that. And I, that's not what I was saying, but I am right wrongly." You know, she has like a wrong perception that I'm right, and I'm like. Yeah, no, well, you know, yeah, that's what I said. And I'll catch myself and you're like, you fucking lie, you motherfucker. And in my head, I'm like, I'm taking this one. Dude, I, I don't get many <laughs> W's, dude. I don't care if it's real or not. <laughs> but yeah, it's like just being honest with yourself and trying to get out of that mode. Like, and that's where the for my for me, doing the mindfulness stuff, because again, it's not just about mindfulness for the sake of escaping stuff and like, oh, I'm gonna bliss out and be peaceful. It's mindfulness for the sake of like, you know, when when my wife's like you don't do lecturing, lecturing me about a thing I inherently don't care about. Like you gotta, you know, put the food away before you eat. And it's like, sh let me eat, shut up. Like, let me eat and stop it. But it's like, in order to sit there and take her side of it, to hear the whole thing. Cause if, if you just sit there and go, let it, let it come out and go, okay, okay. I could see that rather than like, well, but yeah, but fuck yeah, but yeah, you don't do that. You know, it's just, it doesn't mm -hmm. go anywhere. You gotta let, you have to let it, you have to be able to withstand that kind of negative talk and you know that goes all the way back that can like start triggering you all the way back to childhood man you know if, mm. if you had a spaz mom and a woman starts to kind of like raise her voice on you you're all of a sudden an eight-year-old dude in my head i'm just like oh, yep. oh, oh, oh. so it's like you know and they talk about that a lot it's called like transference it's like you know you're not that's what i would deal with uh kids in, in a grade school you see this a lot because it's like you know a male teacher there wasn't a lot of them but they could they would say stuff to him wasn't a problem but there would be like it's just this one lady, and when this one lady talks mean to you, and you, you dig and dig, and like, oh, you know, it turns out, you know, your your foster mother used to beat you and scream at you and say stuff. So it's like that stuff's real, man. You don't think about it; it's so buried in your head. But like, dude, when a woman raises her voice at me, I'm like, I'm like, oh Jesus Christ, stop, 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 in my head. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's one of those things where if you can like kind of weather that, let them get it out, and just be like, all right, I hear what you're saying. Just understand this, and you know, a lot of times it, it'll just go, oh rather than just like bu -bu 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 -bu, up and up mm. and up and up. But it, you know, it does, it takes like, dude, you know, and again, I, I, things it help study mindfulness. And I also think just getting older can help too. Not everybody. I know people who are old and, uh, you know, still spazzing all the time, but dude, just being able to let them get their stuff, just let them get it out. Just let them get it out. You know, don't try to cut it off. The only thing too, is sometimes they'll like, they'll be lecturing you and then they'll just like repeat and start again. It's like, all right, you already said that Fuck, stop. But you know, so yeah, man. It, it, again, I saw this right here. It's like, dude, um, the one guy was like, this is just literally me and my wife. It's like, dude, this was, you know, this is the stuff that if you, again, if you just, can people can, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, obviously eval always evaluate your relationships. And, and, you know, the other thing I was reading too is like a lot of times relationships, I was telling us, they end up in like emotional slavery where like, you just feel like, well, I have to do this. Both people are indebted to the other person. And it's like, it shouldn't be like that at all, man. It, you know, it's not good, but it's like a lot of this stuff gets saved. A lot of the need for the couples counseling can get saved on just like approaching dating in a more conscious way rather than just like, I'm alone. I'm alone. Am I worthy? You know, you come from a place, if you're not comfortable with aloneness, you're entering the dating market, just like, you know, fueled on uh, high octane insecurity. And it, you know, it just, you just whoop, hop in the first foxhole you can get into. And it's like, all right, let's fight it out now. So, you know, it's, yeah. it goes well, all the way back to like, you know, before relationships to like your relationship with yourself. Sorry. No, a hundred percent. And plus, I mean, every guy listening to this, we, we all know that somewhere in the back of your head, it's like, it takes a lot of effort to right to get a date, let's just say, right. Or to, yeah. to get the one that you think you want. Right. Um, but then to get out of it when it's not going the way it, you think it should be, there's an opportunity cost there. Or there's a, there's a certain fear. It's like, Oh, if I get out of this, right, then I might be lonely. Right then, I might not be able to get back into any relationship whatsoever. So I think I think a lot as men, we need to hear that more from other men. It's like, no, number one, you are worthy. Number two, constantly build up your skill set, right? Build up your values. So that way, your value in the marketplace will always be increasing. So you you have to worry less about your your alternate options. And for the married men on this, thing, I'm sorry, but this so this this part is not for you. It's if if you are in a relationship that is bad for you or you're not getting value from, you do not have to stay in that. And it might be scary to get out, but just realize that if you get out and you trust in your effort to build up your skills and build who you are as a man, your 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 options do not decrease, right? They severely increase over time. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many, many, many examples of this. Um, so uh, the fourth thing of just to, to complete the four horsemen of the apocalypse, if uh, 
people want to know. So we got on the three. So the first one um, is, uh, what was it? Uh, criticism. The second one was contempt. The third one was defensiveness. And the fourth one is called sto stonewalling. Sto stonewalling mean meaning that, you, and this is what I do constantly, absolutely constantly. Stonewalling where you get into an argument and then I just go blank. I go like Michael Myers style, like the, 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 the mask of that Michael Myers, which is the void of emotion, right? And just like, whatever, right? Like you win, you know, and it's boom, just like, and I don't look at the person and in the book, they outlined it perfectly, right? It's like, you stop talking, you cut off all potential opportunities for reviving it, right? And you just look, look the other way and that's it. Now, the funny thing is what they found was when they measured the heart rate of those people stonewalling, it was usually above 100, sometimes up north of 140 beats per minute. So their brains were putting them into fight or flight mode. And when you get, they call that emotional flooding. When you get emotionally flooded in a debate, you are no longer able to rationally communicate. Literally, blood is no longer in your prefrontal cortex. It goes down to your limbic system. You are you are reacting emotionally. It's not possible. So what they suggest there is literally take a 20 minute breather. And mm -hmm. 20 minutes is very specific. Respectfully ask to remove yourself from the room and, and explain to your spouse or your girlfriend why you have to do that and just say, I'll be right back. Give me 20 minutes. And then do that thing works wonders and then being willing to work through it. And then Matt, something that you were talking about <clears throat> is, uh, is I very much agree with active listening. Are you listening to your partner in the way with they, without judgment? Like that's the rule, like allow them to speak their piece. And can you articulate back to them what they are saying? Don't just let them say what they're – most of the time, we don't even let them say what they want, <laughs> want to say. Or, yeah, right? do do blank ears. Just be like, all right, go ahead, talk. And yeah. Head, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to hear this. It's going to upset me. Yeah. No, exactly. So so allow them to say what they're saying. And 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 I, actually, the author even says he writes notes when his, when his wife tells him, gives him the critiques. And then be able to articulate back to them – what you feel that they are saying, because I guarantee you there's something lost in translation. Oh yeah. Sorry, I got to, I got to, uh, you know, acknowledge that guy for taking notes, just sitting there while his bass talking is being like, all right, say this. Dude, yeah. I've, I've also, I've, and I, I've secret, I've gone back and forth on this. I've thought about recording the next time I get into an argument is reaching my phone and just recording just to like play it back. And like, all right, here's, we're going to listen to this now. You know, I think I'm actually going to do that. I'll, I'll report back and see how that goes. But the, uh, I think that would be good because then it, whenever it devolves into kind of like, nah, you said this way and like you said this, like I didn't say that. And it's like, well, it, it was like tone. It was like, I, I, would, I didn't even have a bad tone, you know? So it's like, you almost need that just for one time to pull it out and be like, dude, because we do the thing you're talking about. We've, we've gone to couples counseling. It was super helpful. And you know, it was because she had this insurance that was just like awesome. So like, it was like 25 bucks for us to go. That's the other thing too. That stuff can get expensive. Um, but the thing they told us to do that it really helped is just that you were saying, Wes, just pause. As soon as things get heated, pause. You know, just like, hey, you know, I'm pausing this. Well, let's just, you know, again, setting a time I think is good because then people who call the pause get to like dictate something. It kind of gives the pause itself can then be fought over, which I've done. I've been like fucking pause. No, <laughs> no pause. You know, so mm -hmm. it's like something that has to be agreed upon. And it, there should be a time limit because otherwise the pauser can just kind of ice the other person out for like, an, you know, you, you shouldn't be able to do that. Mm. So, dude, and it really is. It's like if you can stay away from the – there, there is a whole – oh, my God. What's the guy's name? Marshall Rosenthal or something? I forget his name, but he, he was the guy who did the nonviolent communication stuff. And those videos are interesting to watch because he even says, like, dude, you're never – like chances are you're not going to talk like that he's like but he's like if you can like adopt some of these principles where it's like you're never ever making a statement about the other person like you were saying you don't make a statement about the person themselves you're like here's this thing you're doing and here's why it's violating some need of mine and if you can't articulate mm -hmm. if you can only articulate that as like a, you were bad it's like nobody wants to hear that dude nobody mm -hmm. ever wants to hear that at all yeah is it john cornfield <clears throat> Um, I wanted to see, cause I know we're running up here on an hour, but I yeah. love talking about this kind of stuff and we're getting a ton of great comments. I wanted to see, uh, why, uh, Dylan was mentioning how him and his wife have an interesting relationship cause she works full time, but doesn't pay any of the bills and they've got some hiccups there. I want to see maybe if we can have him on or maybe even your new buddy, uh, Sydney, if he, if he's up for coming on, but yeah, yeah. Get one, one session in here real quick. Let's do a little bit of Dylan and I'll, uh, Dylan, if you're not cool with it, just reject it. It's no problem. Um, and, I, and after that, I'll pull Sid the Kid up. Sid the Kid has a – Sid the Kid's got a handful of the house. He's got three kids. 
wife. Nice. Yeah. He's doing it, man. Oh, yeah. But I think understanding. Right, Dylan is not having it. That's fine, okay. Dylan. I'll bust up Sid the Kid. And we can maybe – oh, shit. Let me see here. Maybe we can uh, – there we go. Sid the Kid is – Coming on pretty soon. But, yeah, I think this stuff's important, too. And the reason I think it's important is, like, dude, if, if I'm if there's trouble in the house, I'm not getting anything done. My, my mm. mind, I'm in a poisonous mood. I, I, I'm not getting – so it's, like, this is, like, ultimate step one, you know, especially, like I said, if you're juggling a bunch of balls, dude. If, if it's, like, if your house is full of, like, contempt and kind of, like, scornful whispers, I, I'm too sensitive to that. I, I, I just can't focus on anything or be productive. What up, Sid? What up? What you doing, man? Sydney West, West Sydney. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? Great. I uh about to head over to jiu jujitsu at uh, noon. Okay. Yeah, we can we can do a quick little little uh check in. I think you said uh Sydney, I think it was your comment. You said you did you actually record an argument and then listen to it back? Yeah, we record so we when we were uh trying to get through what were clear communication issues and, and, and just like you described, like we we were just both approaching uh each disagreement with with such different perspectives mm -hmm. until we hashed out what those different perspectives were, we weren't going to be able to actually have the discussion. So dude, thank you for saying that you are spot on, sir. Spot on. Yeah. I mean, you have to agree on what reality is. Yes. Or at least, at least come close to what that agreement is. Yeah. So, so we did, we did that. We did the, uh, the, the listening to an argument, but that was after we had, so one of the big issues with her is that she always felt that I was very judgmental of her behaviors and actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I was trying to do is like me just like acknowledging something isn't necessarily a negative judgment of, 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 of something. You know, it's like if I make an observation that doesn't necessarily have any emotional weight with it mm -hmm. as far as the way I'm uh, internalizing it. And she she really couldn't fathom that i don't I think a lot of women just can't fathom mm. that somebody's cr criticism doesn't also come with something about their character so mm -hmm. we did this like experiment i think I'm, i told matt about it before we did this thing where i was like all right so we're, we're in we're in my bedroom i was like all right how about like what what is something you've always wanted to do but you feel judge like people judge you about and she's like she wanted she's she's always wanted to dance more i was like, all right well how about you close your eyes and then dance. And then when you open your eyes, you'll tell me what sorts of judgments you felt from me. And then uh, she closed her eyes and started dancing and I left the room immediately. <laughs> and she, you know, came into the living room kind of like, you know, with her, not like, like I, I would say almost with her tail tucked between her legs, but she also kind of was like happy to know that, that whatever she felt I wasn't actually in there doing it, you know? Mm. So we, we talked about that and we talked about how like she immediately felt like that I was judging her and she even kept her eyes closed because she knew that I was in there judging whether or not she opened her eyes. Mm. So that's an interesting little experiment, man. Dude, that's nine, that's ninth level wizardry right there because dude, again, you, you can Harry be getting, Potter. You can be getting your feet. <laughs> you can get your feet held to the fire for something that is more or less an, their internal issue, and you know people. And you can do that back to them, but it's like that's something really to be cognizant of because you know I I can definitely say that that's something you know. And again, that takes like a some really kind of uh, deeper considerations and thinking because you know you don't want to just blow people's stuff off, but yeah, you also shouldn't be getting crushed for you know an insecurity that's then being projected on you, which again you know. Some of it could be true that, you know, maybe, like I said, I, I fall into this all the time. will be like, oh, man, I, I want to fit this stuff on. She's had a kid, obviously, so she's worried about that. But then she'll eat, and I'm like, and, you know, she's like, oh, I feel so sick now. And so, you know, I'll be like, okay, well, here's a, here's a common thing. You eat, you'll eat shitty food, feel sick, and then feel bad about yourself because you can't fit something. So I'll be like, hey, you know, right when she's about to eat that, I'm like, how about you don't do that? And, you know, that's just like a – you're in you the know, war zone there, bro. I'm in that absolute, absolute yeah, battlefield. That. Yeah, dude, absolute <laughs> battlefield. But I'm like, it's not you like run you away know. instantly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, dude, like, how about you just don't like stop? And I don't want you to tell me when to do that. Then it's like, I do want you to tell me when to stop. I don't want you to tell me. When to, it's like this, you know, it's like, okay, this is an impossible situation. And I, even when I'm taking flack on it, I'm not going to get spazzed out because it's like, I'm just, I know I, I this is a, there's situations where she's got me to, 
let's say, solid ground in terms of time management organization where I fought, kicked, and screamed. And, you know, she just kept stuck to her guns, and I'm glad she did that. So then, you know, I've been trying to stick to my guns on those things. But, but yeah, man, it's like it, it is a slippery slope. I see that. But it it's not even like I, once you make it – this is the thing, though. When I, I make it – and I, I believe this. I'm like, dude, you can gain 20 pounds. I don't care. You're just going to be upset with yourself, and that's what bothers me. So it's like mm -hmm. – and I legitimately don't give a shit. I told her. I'm like, dude, you, you, you know, whatever. But it's like – that's one of those things where it's like, like said, you're talking about like, is this like an internal thing that they're taking out on you and being able to recognize what is and what isn't. I think that was like a brilliant way of like, you know, at least showing her that maybe some of the time she might just be in her head and taking that out on you. I think that's, that's good to do. Yeah. It's, it's a cool exercise you guys did. Well, it was, it was, I think, I mean, of course she learned from it, but I, I feel like for me, it put a lot of pressure on me to start being first with, with these with these um with with viewing things you know coming from my perspective only when it was when it was me so I, what i mean by that is so she realized that i wasn't judging her you know the way that she thought i was judging her but then i realized that i had to stop applying whatever judgments i'm projecting from her onto me and if if this is going to be a thing in a relationship somebody has to to be first somebody has to to take that leap and go right. it's all me this is all in my head you know to the point where if, like if she was setting if she was like literally setting my pants on fire you know i had to be like well the reason why i'm upset with this is because how i feel about fire from when i was a kid, you know what i mean it was, yeah yeah you know so it, 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 how it, i feel it, about fire <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, gets, it gets a little extreme but like no, I get you know, it, yeah when somebody's setting the example you know, it's easier for another person to, cause so, so, you know, when she sees me being first, you know, the, the, the competitor in her, in her is like, well, I want to be first. Like I yep. want to be the one to, to, you know, be taking these steps towards clear communication in these complicated, complicated scenarios. True. So, I mean, I mean, dude, that might be a meta competition, dude. Yeah. Well, it's also, that's, that's something awesome. too, that I think is like wonderful piece of a piece of advice is like, just if you don't, if you feel like your relationship lacks a thing, be the thing that you think it lacks. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, be that thing that you don't think you're, rather than just like being like, oh my God, you're so annoying. It's like, well then do that. If you don't like someone talking to you a certain way, making like a, a, a Herculean effort to only talk respectful, not raise your voice and to sit and actively listen, do all the things that you feel like they're not doing. And then, because someone might just be like, not know how to do that. And they see you doing it and they go, oh, okay, cool. You know, and, and vice versa, obviously. But yeah, well, I think I, that's. Yeah. So and Sydney, um, I know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say this too, because I, I, the reason why I brought that up in the beginning was to say that we we did that before recording an argument and listening back to it. Mm. So we already had this we already had this notion that we're both taking in projected judgments up from each other into an argument, and so when we listened back to it, it was the it was with the purpose of actually hearing how we were talking to each other and being talked to out of the context of frustration and anger. Yeah. I think what you're hitting on, and I, I totally get it. It's like, you got to do it in a way where the intention is to make progress, not to win. Yes. And I have a major problem with that. Like I'll be the first to admit, like I want to win everything all the time. And I, like, I don't care if it's people close to me, I just want to win but I have to talk myself out. It's like, no, the intention is to win together, not mm -hmm. win against each other. Um, so I think that's awesome, man. But Sydney, I know you said you've got to yeah, run, but one, one thing we want to do grab you for is I know you're new to the team. So welcome to the team, brother. Really appreciate you joining. Um, uh, what are some, what, what's a, one or two wins you had for this week? Win just being, what did you accomplish this week? Whether it be jujitsu, whatever, just so you can share with the group. Oh yeah. Well, uh, last night I went up against this guy, Alec, who completely ragdolls me all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I survived without being choked out or armbarred last night. And I felt really good about that. And then, yeah, um, you know, this this past uh, like this week so far, uh, I haven't raised my voice towards my kids in any disciplinary way. Uh, so and that that's huge. Like that is so huge because uh, a lot of times you're raising your voice before you even realize that you're raising your voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, dude, this number one, we appreciate you and, and thank you for coming on. And the reason we do the win section is because as men, we're society doesn't necessarily, we're, you know, it, we need a group where we can say, hey, here, here are my points on the board. And then everybody else applauds you. So great, great job this week, brother. Oh, yeah.
All right, thanks, man. I'll be I'll definitely be back for these often. Oh, yeah, man. See you, man. See you, see you yep, later, guys. Yeah, SZA, man. Oh, we go way back. Way back in the stand-up days. Oh, nice. And uh, I think it's Francisco. Yeah, he says, oh, my God, I'm on the same boat with the kids. That's what's cool about the team is that we're all experiencing a lot of the same things so we can share those vulnerable moments. Like, yeah, I yell at my kids all the time. It's like, and then Francisco says, yeah, shit, like I gotta, I do that too. Yeah. How can we work on it together? So yep. that's what's about, man. This is cool. Hell yeah, so, dude. Uh, what, if you don't, do you, you mind if we hop into the winds, brother? Yeah, dude, let's do it. I got to, I actually have a, I have a big relationship. So this is, this is a, I would say a, a great testimonial to doing this. So I don't know if you recall, but on Monday, I said I was going to set up a little surprise date on Wednesday night. That was, you know, because I was like, you know, I've been doing a lot of work. I've been, you know, doing a little bit of traveling here and there. And, you know, we're not spending as much quality time together. I'm like, let me do. And I picked Wednesday because I'm like, Thursday night, I had to go to New York. Tuesday night, I was like, yeah, I usually do the podcast. I'm like, Wednesday night would be perfect. So I tell her, I say, hey, you know, just, we got a little something going on Wednesday night. I got something planned out for us. Turns out it's our anniversary, bro. I totally forgot. But the uh... <laughs> your secret's safe here with us on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I momentarily forgot, and uh, the, it was just like, dude, I was laughing. I'm like, holy shit! The fact that I like sitting down and consciously organizing my time—that if that's not a humongous W, dude, you know, oh my god, come on, come on, oh, dude, yeah. that that was big. She'd be like, oh yeah, perfect for anniversary. I was like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a. Uh, although to be fair, to be fair, we have a bunch. We have like scattered anniversaries. She's a very. She has like one of those like elephant memories. We're like, well, this is the first day we you know we, we went on a date. This is the first day. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. So this is like that when we like officially became a boyfriend and girl. This is like the, the start of us being together. Uh, like just as like a boyfriend and a girlfriend five years ago. So mm -hmm. the uh, so you know that and I, I kind of like it because it's like it's easy to remember. Um, well, not apparently not easy enough, but it, you know, ten twenty one, <laughs> it's got a nice little ring to it. So, but yeah, that was for me. I was like, and that's again when you, you talk about goals, everyone thinks it's all just like money goals, this that, this that, you know. And it, when you take this holistic approach, you're almost making sure you're not just doing that at the expense of, you know, it's like a self policing thing where like you're making sure you're not like going too hard in one direction that you're literally just kind of like, you know, not doing all of the other things that add like the texture and richness to your life. And dude, it was like. That one was that just adding a little thing like that. It means so much, dude. It was as simple as making a dinner reservation, you know, just mm -hmm. like calling a babysitter. Um, so it was like that was a big for me. That was a big W. I felt I was like, hell yeah, dude, that was awesome. Um, awesome yeah, and other than that, I have my other my other little win was I, I started now because I am I'm, I am like super pressed for time. I feel like uh, between everything going on and the writing was kind of suffering a little bit. And I, I started to do a, a new thing in my car, which I didn't invent this by any means. But um, in terms of writing, I figured out in a way that's pretty effective for me to, if I don't have like the hour and a half, I can sit down and like type words. There's like, if I'm driving somewhere for that day, like, you know, I'm like, oh, I got a half an hour drive. I will sit out. So I have this thing I do where I'll, I'll take an index card and say, all right, what's the next like scene I want to kind of do? Like what's going on in the story? What's the next thing? I'll jot down a couple notes on an index card. Then on my drive, I'll just start just act, just talking it out. Just like, and this is what this happened. This is what this person thinking. This is what this person saying. Mm -hmm. And then I'll cut Then when I finally get a chance to write, it's like, I kind of did a lot of the thinking work and I'm just sitting and I have like a, a thing I can go off of. And like, that's been something that's helped me a lot. Like I've been able then to kind of like squeeze time that usually it's kind of wasted into like a very uh, helpful activity in a way that actually I think helps things big time. So that was my other well, And so can you, can you repeat that? So you, what did you squeeze in? I want to make sure I got it. So before it would be like, Oh, I don't have time to write. I'm not going to be able to write today. And now it's like, no, I'm going to do something related to writing. Even if that's sitting down and just like jotting down a couple notes for a scene on a business on, a, on an index card. Okay. And then I, I was, so I was doing that and I was like, well, shit, man, if I'm actually driving, I could just like put on a, a tape, like, you know, my phone recorder and just dictate. So I've been starting to kind of just like dictate if while I'm taking like long drives in that time, I would dude. just be like listening to music and dude, it's actually, I, I, it's pretty helpful. I mean, again, like I said, I didn't invent this by any means, but it's like, it's another way I've, I've kind of refined and optimized my schedule. Cause I'm saying like, I will fit these things into my day. There's no like, well, I just didn't get to, you know, and that, that does happen here and there. But like now I've, I've taken away another layer of excuses where it's like, well, you can always dictate, you know? So I've, I've gotten out of the idea that I need to be like strictly in a chair at a computer. And dude, dude it, it's helpful. It's helped big time. That's enormous. The dictation on your phone, I swear, man. And then because of, what do they say? Uh, they say uh, writing is not writing. Writing is rewriting. Yeah. It's like the initial step is getting those thoughts out of your head. Dude, That that it's funny, man. We're constantly on this mega mind thing, bro. I know, dude. I literally, 
as of last night start, or two nights ago started dictating more and more stuff. I was like, why have I not been doing this? It's pretty crazy. It's all, and also I saw, the, I've heard of Evernote yeah, before. Mason was saying, what up, Matt, Mason? We're cycle sisters, can't acknowledge. We're cycle sisters. Oh, dude, hundred percent. I've said this a thousand times. They were mind twins. All right. So cool. Big Thanks. time. Come on. Big time. Mind twins, dude. <laughs> I saw, I, I saw <laughs> Evernote rules from Mason. I, I, I've heard about that before. I got to check that back out. Sorry. I, my attention got snagged. But yeah, dude, I'm telling you, we're always on, we're on a wavelength. We've been on it. I've called Wes for years and been like, dude, get this. And he's like, just read, just thinking about that. Just read the book. Yeah. And it's pretty yeah. wild actually. Yeah, it's awesome. So that's, that's awesome, man. Any other wins for the week? Uh, no, that was pretty much it. Like I said, the, the, the wins really are like, you know, sticking to the workout, obviously. Um, and the, the, the relationship win was a big one. We had a really great time that honestly, I think eclipsed all my other wins, but it's also like adding that another dimension to kind of writing that I think has been my other one as well. Yeah. What well, you got? awesome fucking job. And then the other thing is like a lot of the comments over on the side, like Delco Jim knocking out his, his driver's permit. Hell yeah. And putting himself in uncomfortable situations. That was awesome. And I think it was Jamie uh, saying that he, he got his first run in, in a while, in a long time. I think he said in years or something. That's awesome too. And Matt, I, uh, that you are inspiring a lot of the guys to get out there and just start doing some physical stuff. So that's pretty cool. And then Mike Hunt, I think he said it's a win. <laughs> what, what, you what fell happened? for it, dude. You fell for the old Mike Hunt. Oh, oh, nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whatever that guy's name is, uh, he said it's a win for him showing up to the conversation. Hell and, yeah, man. I mean, getting you to say Mike Hunt is a win. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, points, points for that guy. So, uh, so, um, but showing up for the conversation is actually really important. Like, oh yeah, no, I a lot of people it. don't don't think that is, and whether that's that this conversation or just conversations about progress, that's the game changer. Like, that's what will help change your mindset. Is like when you talk to another guy who's at, who's ambitious and trying to accomplish things, that changes your mindset just a tiny bit. And then all of a sudden you get out for that run or you do the one push up that you haven't done and haven't done in a while. So yeah, it's like, man. hell yeah, man, keep on showing up for the conversations. I mean, we've said it before on a, on a one before it was, uh, you know, this is this kind of like informational vegetables. So it's like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you're just taking in crap all day and it's fine. You know, crap's great. It's great to kind of kick back with some stuff and you know, it, it's always fun, but it's like, it's nice to toss a little something else in the mix. Just, you know, keep a well-balanced information diet because that's the stuff kicking around in your head. So it's nice to throw, some other stuff in there that might align with uh you know positive action oh yeah and dude if you can just do one thing to, if, if all this conversation does is, is make you talk to your wife a little bit differently today right like yeah. or whoever that's a fucking win right there 100 percent um so for me the the wins uh mm -hmm. got done the admin for roma stuff so asb Ooh. let me know the, the the email uh email was broken and so on so i did some of the admin stuff there um put a lot more stuff up on youtube and up on our podcast and also realized that there's a lot of things broken um and then made a ton of progress on the video that's going to take me probably another few weeks but here's the other thing that we do during our wins like i will tell you i'm still losing at the scorecard and i'm telling mm -hmm. everybody that like i keep saying every week i'm going to get you guys got done the scorecard going to do it going to do it I refuse to not to I refuse to let up on that goal. And that's one thing that I think people should hear. It's like pick what's important to you. And no matter how many times you fail at it in the future, it doesn't matter. Like if you're committed and you still like every single time you don't do it, ask yourself if you want to recommit to it. And if it's an important goal, you should recommit to it. So I'm not stopping on that. Just so you guys know, Romas, like all these conversations we're having, it took me and then eventually I brought in Matt. And he really, really helped me. This was this has been in the works for like a year and a half. I failed every single week for a year and a half. And then now, just to hear Sydney talk about his stuff or hear Delco Jim and all those things, we would have never had that and the pleasure that I get from that and us all helping out each other if it wasn't the constant failure for literally every single week, a year and a half straight. So I think it's important to acknowledge your losses, but don't get beat up about them. It's like, that's what makes the game fun. As Warren Buffett says, if you stepped on the golf course and you hit a hole in one every single time from day one, you would stop on day two. It just would not be fun. Right. Yeah. So the contrast is what makes it fun. So I appreciate all you guys. And uh, and one thing we might start doing is I might actually start doing it. So Matt and I are having conversations every usually Monday and Friday, but I might actually start doing it on YouTube live every single day. I'm not sure. And that's just like a quick except for Sunday and maybe not Saturday. I'm not sure. But just a little 10 minute like, hey, here's what I read last night, offering it out to you guys if it'll help you for the day. A little quick group huddle for the day, just 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then everybody off with their day. If you want to show up, great. I'm still not sure if I'm going to commit to it, but I'm putting it out there 
just as a quick like team meeting in the morning saying, hey, what are you guys up to? Here's one thing you can take with you for the day that I read last night or whatever it was. And we can always hop on you know, with, with live people and so on. So anyway, just throwing it out there to the universe. We'll see if it works. I love that, man. That, that'll be, yeah, that'll be pretty tight. Cool. Brother, All right, dude. As always, dude, man. Awesome. Always you guys, awesome to see everybody. Also, too, the week's not over. We still have Friday, so I yes. should I should be on par to hit. Besides setting up my pull up bar, that's my other goal. If if I should be hitting almost all my goals this week, which will be pretty nice. That'll be a win. Awesome. Hell yeah. All right, dudes.